Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is the Backtable ENT podcast. Here, we bring you conversations with the best and brightest minds in the field of otolaryngology with the hope that you can take this information and apply it to your practice. I'm Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist here at UT Southwestern at Dallas, in Dallas, Texas. And I'm Ashley Agan. Uh, I'm a general otolaryngologist uh, practicing in an academic setting at UT Southwestern in Dallas as well. How's it going, Gopi? It's going great. I'm so excited. I'm always so excited for our guests. And I love that we get to come together and, you know, talk to each other and have these really cool discussions um, and really give us insight into the way people think, um, it, you know, in otolaryngology. So I'm very excited for today. It's a great day for a podcast. And we have a great guest. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, get into the introduction here. We have Dr. Nina Shapiro. She is the director of pediatric ear, nose and throat at the Mattel Children's Hospital UCLA and professor at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. She's an author of several books, including 50 Studies Every Pediatrician Should Know and the Handbook of Pediatric Otolaryngology. She also writes for non-medical audiences and published Take a Deep Breath, which is focused on breathing issues from nose to lungs, normal to abnormal for parents of zero to five-year-olds. Then came Hype, which was published in 2018. This is a doctor's guide to medical myths, exaggerated claims, and bad advice, and helps patients understand how to tell what's real and what's not. Um, she has received such rave reviews for her books and so many physicians, including physician authors who are New York Times bestselling authors. Um, she's been featured on NPR, Wall Street Journal, The Doctors, The Washington Post, BBC, World News, just to name a few. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Nina Shapiro. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Thank you for coming on. We're so excited. Um, before we kind of get into it, uh, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, about your practice? Sure. So uh, I am from the East Coast. I'm from New I grew up in New York and I went to college in New York at Cornell. And then I went to Harvard for medical school and stayed at Harvard for residency. And then I thought I would try something different uh, for pediatric otolaryngology fellowship. So I spent most of the year uh, in San Diego at Rady Children's uh, with, for my fellowship. And I spent part of the year, because uh, they have actually a sort of a relationship between uh, their group and Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. So I did part of my year in London. The second part of the year was in San Diego. So um, it's really nice here. <laughs> and uh, I thought I'd be there for a year and, you know, I'm Northeast all the way. And uh, I ended up just uh, looking at jobs um, on the West Coast and found my dream job at UCLA um, and have been there uh, ever since. So I've been on faculty at UCLA since 1997. I met my current husband at UCLA. He's a head and neck cancer surgeon in our department. And uh, we've been together <laughs> Not, not quite as long as I've been there, but close. And uh, and uh, we have two teenage kids who've been home on Zoom for most of the year and uh, hopefully getting back to school. And, and here we are back in, in person in some form soon. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got into maybe writing you know, books, um, particularly, you know, in a lot of a lot of us do a lot of scientific writing, because that's the path of, you know, getting into medicine and residency and doing the things we do. Um, tell us about, you know, what got you into writing for the, the non physician audience? And, you know, do you have a background in writing or communication? <sighs> So I have no prior background in any writing except for the writing that we all do in, in college and even a little bit in medical school. Um, and I, as as all, both of you, have been very versed in writing academic articles, peer-reviewed articles, or, you know, and then occasionally some chapter chapters for academic books. And it's a very uh, specific way of communicating. We communicate, you know, we have this language that we take for granted when we speak to other doctors, um, when we speak to other otolaryngologists, when we speak to other pediatric otolaryngologists, it gets more and more specific. But I also, and you also know that it's, it's it's a different way of communicating when you communicate with patient families, when you communicate with children, um, when you communicate with 
patient families that have some background. So let's say it's a patient who's a physician, but not necessarily in our specialty. So just over the years of practicing, um, especially in Los Angeles, uh, where people have very specific ideas of, of what's healthy, um, I became very interested in how to communicate with people from different backgrounds. Where's the sweet spot when you speak to them? Uh, where's the sweet spot when you write for them? So it was really just something that developed over time. I started speaking to non-medical audiences when my children were in preschool. I would speak to the preschool parents about ENT problems, uh, speak to the kids about problems when they were a little bit older, uh, and then just started writing gradually. It wasn't sort of one day where I said, I'm going to write a book. Um, you know, I just started writing some op-eds. I would write for, you know, submit for magazines blogs, things like that. So it really just evolved over time. And as with most things, one thing leads to another and it keeps going. <laughs> what, um, what keeps you writing? Like, how do you do it? I mean, you know, we're both, Ash and I are both in, uh, at UT Southwestern. So we're in the more of an academic practice. And like you said, um, the check boxes are, you know, writing scientific papers. And I find that it can be really difficult to just sit down and start, whether it's something like a case report to, you know, a chart review to a bigger data. How do you keep, what keeps you going? Because for some people, it's like this very overwhelming sense of, oh my God, I have all this stuff to do. Yeah, it is overwhelming. And, and, you know, I'm, you know, at UCLA, it's also a very sort of academically based, uh, uh, position that I have. Uh, so, you know, I've gone through, you know, we have sort of an up or out policy for promotion to associate and then, and then to full. So you do have to be, remain academically productive. So I continue to do that primarily with clinical research and, um, you know, we have residents and, and medical students who are very eager. So we have nice groups of people that, that can work on projects together. I still work with people from across the country on group, you know, papers that we submit. So that still goes on. Um, but but the writing itself, that's the non-medical, right, or the medical writing for the non-medical audience is, uh, it's really just motivated by what's going on in the world or what I hear or what I hear that people are concerned about. So um, I also write for Forbes uh, online, which is, you know, the Forbes Health Contributor uh, section. So that's very, very current news that's that's coming up. So those are really, uh, it, it's it's sort of like a blog, but the difference is it's not my opinion. It's just really health news. I try to make it as, as non-opinion, it's hard, but <laughs> non-opinionated as I can. Uh, so that just is really motivated by what's going on in the world. I try to find an ENT bent for those. So for instance, if a celebrity dies from an ENT related illness, I'll write about that and, and have a little background uh, for the non-medical audience. But it's really just motivated by communicating with people and by hearing about what's going on in the world and hearing about the misinformation and the way people misconstrue what they hear and what they think is good for them. You know, people are always talking about big pharma. I, I like to talk about big wellness as another com huge scam and waste of money and, you know, harm uh, for people. So, you know, I try to write based on what I hear and what I feel needs to be sort of reconciled. And as part of your routine, because, um, you know, you have a cl busy clinical practice, you have a busy academic, uh, you know, I don't know, practice is the right word, but, you know, as well as writing a book, do you have like fixed time every week that you try to sit down and write? Like, when do you do it? Or how do you do it? <laughs> that, that's, that's, I get that a lot. So it, it, I don't really say, okay, I'm going to sit for, you know, three hours every Tuesday afternoon because I have this block of time. I, I can't really work like that. Um, I do sort of work sporadically as both of you know, um, you know, I, I love our anesthesia colleagues, but, you know, turnover time is, is precious. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, you know, eight or 10 cases, 
you know, and if you have really good turnover time and that's 30 minutes and it takes you five minutes to talk to the family, there's 25 minutes times eight. There's a good chunk of time. And, you know, I'm not writing a novel, so it, it's not that kind of, you know, devoted hours and hours of, of intricate thought process, but you can get a, you know, a chunk done on a, on a surgery center day. Yeah. Uh, so I use, you know, spaces like that. And, you know, uh, so during the day sometimes, and that's the nice thing about having, you know, computers with us or a laptop or just, you know, log into Google Docs or whatever format you're using, uh, little, you know, spots here and there. I work in the evenings, you know, my when my kids are doing homework, I'm doing my homework or after they go to sleep. So, you know, little, little spaces here and there. I don't really block out like here's my day to write. I can't, I'm just not that that uh, disciplined. And I, I would venture to, to guess or to assume that you enjoy writing, right? Oh, I love it. I love so, it. <laughs> yeah. So I think that part um, probably, you know, helps as well, because it's something that you enjoy doing. I do. It's, it's I feel like it's, it's sort of, it's not for the way that I like to write. And again, it's completely different from a academic writing. I'll do, I don't, do I love it? Mm that's that's a strong word <laughs> um but you know the the kind of writing that i do enjoy is uh i feel very conversational um that's that's the style that i like to write you know for instance for hype it's very i like it to feel and i did the audio book too which was quite interesting uh 10 and a half hours of <laughs> sitting <laughs> we could do that in your car um <laughs> so but I try to make it a conversation, even if obviously it's a one-way conversation from me, I try to make it as easy to listen to or easy to read uh, as possible, as opposed to, you know, we're so used to reading scientific articles and writing scientific articles, but it's a very strange way, even grammatically, we speak in the passive voice. Even when we dictate an operative report, the patient was taken to the operating room I mean, did it just miraculously get taken to the, <laughs> it's just a very funny way of communicating uh, that we don't even realize we take it for granted. So, um, you know, it's nice to just write in a way that you communicate verbally. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's get into the book. Um, I, I definitely agree. I, I appreciate the, the way the book is written um, to just be, you know, easy to read, like we're having a conversation, you know, not, not like you're reading a textbook or anything like that. So I, I think that, um, that the, you know, uh, re reader, I, I enjoyed that as a reader. And I think, you know, um, pe people will probably appreciate that. Um, the book is called Hype, A Doctor's Guide. Great title. Guide. Great yes. title. Let's just hype. Let's just, I love the title. <laughs> hype, A Doctor's Guide to Medical Myths, Exaggerated Claims, and Bad Advice, How to Tell What's Real and What's Not. Um, so tell us a little bit about the book and what inspired you to write it. So the book is, uh, again, you know, just to say it's not something I just sat down on a on a Tuesday and said, OK, page one, <laughs> um, it, you know, it was really inspired by my day to day work. Uh, you know, you all work with families and patients and, you know, I work with children and just sort of hear and, and I had kids and younger, you know, younger kids in school at the time, just hearing about what people have as far as their concerns, what they're worried about, uh, what they're hearing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I felt like I was continually trying to help people understand what they're hearing in the media primarily, because that's really what we have quick access to, and how people, even if they're not medical, can get good information, even if you have zero science background, um, how to get good information when you hear something in the health news, how to do something as simple as read a label in a grocery store, how not to be, not I hate the word tricked, but, you know, sort of manipulated into thinking that something is good for you and that, you know, thinking that something is necessary for your health. So sort of explain to people that you, you know, that you don't have to be sort of preyed on for fears. You know, people are really afraid of so much that goes on in the world. And a lot of companies, big wellness companies primarily, will prey on that fear that people have. And, and it's not necessarily dangerous, but it's a waste of money, a waste of time, a waste of energy, and it really deflects from what's important. So I was just motivated to have a, a 
reference for people and, you know, hopefully a reference that's fun to read with a lot of anecdotes and a lot of stories and a lot of personal stories to better understand what's what's out there and not necessarily what's current at the time that the book was written, but really just how, you know, even now in the world of COVID, when you hear a piece of news information, how to really tease it apart uh, effectively and and make good decisions based on that. So I was really interested in, and this is uh, early on in your book, The Curse of the Original Belief, um, where if you believe something, you seek out and find information or websites that support this belief. Can you give us examples from this of this from families or patients and how you help them navigate this, quote, curse or belief? It's, it's one of the hardest things. And, you know, that can go, that's for our health and really for anything else, um, you know, in, in your belief system to, to sort of open your mind. And, and for us too, as, you know, as physicians to really open our minds and not be so locked into what we are, what we think is dogma and we think is the final answer. So what people tend to do, and, and I think it's, it's partly just what the online searches are, um, is they seek things that they already know they want to find. So, you know, vaccines are a perfect example, especially currently, but also in the past, you know, we're not talking as much about vaccine hesitation for children, but that's still an issue. So if you are interested in risks of a vaccine or benefits of a vaccine, if you put in the, you know, let's say you're doing a Google search, the specifics that you hope to find, you will find them. So if you put vaccines autism, you will find plenty of information, thousands and thousands of sites within, you know, under a second about vaccines and autism. If you put in vaccines and brain damage, you will find plenty about that. So it it really is a um, you know something that you search for that you'll find. So and and you'll also find people. And you know same thing if you go to social media sites such as Facebook, you can find Facebook groups for anything that you already believe in. You can find that. And it's 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 human nature that we want to to find people who believe the same things that we believe and get that validation. Um, and it's really hard to hear uh, about the other side of things if you already have it. So it's really like a self-fulfilling prophecy and you will continue to sort of delve into that even deeper. The, and, and it's really, really hard to to get out as it continues. So how do you manage those families that, that, you know, the two-year-old with recurrent ear infections that not, who isn't immunized, for example, um, is a very common still that comes in, you know, patient or in family that will come into clinic? Right. It's, it's really hard. And I, what I try to do is um, try to, first of all, and this is, this is really hard for us as physicians. We don't even realize how hard it is, is we have to listen it's really easy to start saying, okay, so here are the reasons why it's important to have these immunizations. And here's what will happen when your child gets this immunization. And here's what's happening because they're not. It's really, we can give a long list and we can give plenty of information as nicely as we can with a smile on our face. Um, but it, it's not as helpful as just listening and saying, well, let's, you know, well, your child, I see they haven't received their immunizations, they haven't received their pneumococcal vaccine, their Prevnar vaccine. Um, what was the reason for that? And, you know, it may be something as simple as, well, you know, they've been so sick and you, we all hear this we've, and it's true, you know, they've been so sick, we haven't even found a window where they're well enough to get their vaccines. Okay. So there's the answer. And then we can kind of fix, you know, hope that they'll get better and to get their vaccines. Um, or they may have reasons that you haven't even considered um, that are valid and genuinely concerning. You know, for instance, they had a family member who had such a horrible reaction and, you know, seizures and fevers. And, you know, so so to really personalize it as opposed to here's the data, here's the reason, here's the number of ear infections they could not have. So. I just sometimes listen and and also to understand that you're not necessarily going to resolve it that 
day and we're all very busy in our in our clinical practices we don't have you know an hour to to discuss vaccine hesitancy with a family and we're not there even their primary care doctors um so you know sometimes it's just a matter of to be continued or you know a phone call at a later date or a follow-up uh conversation just to keep it going um, but i think patients where they sense that the doctor is concerned in a negative sense, I think it's really important not to alienate uh, the families because it's really easy to do. And if they sense that you disdain them or you think that they're making bad decisions, they'll go elsewhere. And, and you know, I'm sure in, in your in Dallas and it's the same thing here. You know, there are plenty of other places they can go and um, where there will be a doctor who won't ask them about vaccines. So, um, you know, I think it's just better to to leave it open that these these are long processes sometimes and we have to be a little more patient and none of us are patient we're surgeons so we don't <laughs> exactly. have, we're not built that way <laughs> but yeah that's so true because those the that belief system you know didn't happen overnight so how would we expect that we'd be able to change it in our you know 15 minute encounter right so um i think that's that's beautiful to kind of just think about just listening being concerned you know trying to help um what about the patients that come in and tell you about the research that they have done? Um, we all know, you know, in this age where there's so much, maybe too much information out there and available at everyone's fingertips and, you know, patients say, well, I've done my research and yada, yada, yada. You know, um, when I think about this, um, on, on the one hand, you know, um, it's the, the, the knee jerk reaction is to be maybe a little offended because you're like, okay, I've spent years and years of my life trying to, <laughs> to learn what I know. And you, you know, did some Google searching. Um, and then there's the, you know, more, um, um, after more reflection, it's like, well, you know, this person is trying to be proactive about their health and trying to, you know, get education and learn and understand what their disease process is. So you have to admire that. Um, and they aren't, they, you know, they may or may not have the education background to really even digest the material that they're finding. Um, I think, you know, your book does a great job of trying to help people understand, you know, bias in literature, um, marketing labels, uh, how, you know, how information gets out there, but it can be really overwhelming. Um, can you comment on, you know, how those conversations happen with patients in your clinic? It, it's tough. And exactly just, he, just hearing you say, I've done, and, and with the bunny ears, I've done my <laughs> research. <laughs> it's like, it's a visceral reaction. We all have, it's, we can't help it. Um, you know, my, my first, you know, our knee jerk response is, well, what lab did you do your research in? And, and, <laughs> and who was your, your mentor? Um, and, and we, and again, it's, it's the same sort of thing. It's, it's tempting to there. I agree, Ashley, with what you were saying that, they are concerned about their health and they're and a lot of people are just trying to find the best information that they can and and I, you know i used to be a little more offended and a little you know sort of put off by that phrase and it, it still makes me cringe a little bit but um every you know i again i like to sort of go with that well what did you find what and and every and and oftentimes especially with, you know, issues of ear infections or, you know, antibiotic use or, you know, decadron around tonsillectomy, they, um, they'll probably find the same JAMA article that we read or some of us wrote. So sometimes they'll be a little surprised, like, yes, that, that's actually a good article. That, that actually has some good information. Um, yes, they did look at 300,000 children over the past 10 years. So sometimes it is actually a decent piece of information that they find. Um, and oftentimes it's not. But again, I think we can't just sort of dis dismiss it. And, um, you know, what they mean by research, if you're non, non, non medical or non scientific means something very different, and that's okay. Um, but but I like to sort of see what they find. And I'm I'm sure or maybe one or both of you have found patients that come to your office with an article 
on something that is is a really good article and a really interesting problem that you perhaps hadn't known about, um, you know, rare issues of, you know, strep induced uh, guttate psoriasis, <laughs> you know, these these rare entities that will, you know, will appear in our practices. And, and thank you for the article. I need to read this. So occasionally it's something useful. Um, but if it is something nonsense, if it is from some extreme Facebook group and that's considered research, then, um, you know, we should by all means, you know, shut that down pretty quickly and explain to them that that is not good. That is a biased site. That is inaccurate information. That is false information. Then we can really go to town to, you know, sort of squash that idea of research. But I find more oftentimes than not, people are finding because a lot of the uh, the uh, academic journals are more freely accessible now online. Uh, they're finding something from the New England Journal or from JAMA or from JAMA Otolaryngology or from our white journal. So occasionally it's it's actually some solid information. Do you find that, you know, we've talked about most of these conversations happening in clinic, but I'm sure these conversations, well, they do happen, you know, when you're consulting on an inpatient or perhaps in the pre-op or even, you know, you've done the surgery and now, you know, you're in uh, talking to them in the consultation room after surgery. And sometimes the questions or suggestions are, you know, maybe not consistent or, you know, how do you do you find that those conversations are any different than in your clinical like when they're in clinic happening or is it pretty much the same you got to listen and kind of see what really what they're really trying to ask or tell you well then i feel like certainly if it's anything around surgery uh I tend to be a little more definitive. Uh, a lot of families are interested in take, having their children use certain herbal supplements around tonsillectomy, for instance. That's one of the most common procedures that we do as pediatric otolaryngologists. And a lot of the herbal supplements can lead to increased bleeding, um, other issues that we don't even know about. So for those, I'm very clear, no. <laughs> No before, no after. Um, so when it's something like that, where it can potentially really harm the child, uh, I don't really engage in much discussion. It's just a, it's just a simple no. Uh, and you know, same things for any other sort of risky, risky behavior that the child wants to do afterwards. Or for instance, you know, I think I talk about this in the book, and this was one of the motivations for the book where a 15 month old ch choked on a cashew nearly died. And uh, the family was a little bit surprised when I told them that they should probably not feed nuts to their three year old. Um, and they sort of looked at me like, well, but they're, they have high protein and we're vegetarians or something. And, uh, you know, it was devastating to me. <laughs> I think I was more traumatized than the child. And, uh, you know, for those, I, I don't really engage in much. Let's look at the research and let's see what your Facebook friends say. That's just, you know, a little, a little more clear when there's a potential danger, uh, certainly to a child. Yeah. Some things are more cut and dry. Um, and, um, and other things are kind of, you know, in, in, uh, you know, shades of gray. Um, it, and, you know, speaking to that, you know, there are, you know, and in the book, you talk a little bit about, you know, complementary and integrative medical therapies, um, you know, acupuncture, you know, herbs, different things. So I feel like with some, with a lot of patients, there may be kind of a discussion of this, you know, cost benefit analysis of, you know, um, is there is the is the harm low enough? Um, and you know, the placebo effect high enough that, you know, if you want to try this for your tinnitus, then maybe it's okay. Um, you know, th those kinds of situations where we don't have any data that says yes, this works. But you know, if this isn't going to be financially, you know, prohibitive uh, for you, and if it would make you feel like you're doing something for your problem, perhaps one of these more alternative therapies could be an option. Absolutely. I think that I think the key is in not harmful and not costly. So one of the things that we hear about is chiropractics for otitis media. I think that's expensive and dangerous. So 
that I would say a big no to. Acupuncture is pretty safe. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so, you know, though that kind of thing I would, I would say is okay. Um, some of the supplements that people give, for, you know, to reduce colds, you know, for instance, like high dose vitamin C, um, is fine, you know, as long as you're not going to get kidney stones and you're not going to, you know, mega, mega dose on some of those, it's, it's certainly harmless and not that expensive. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, I think that's the key. If it's not harmful, not dangerous, and not prohibitively expensive, and it may help. And as long as you're not delaying something like cancer therapy or, you know, airway obstruction or, you know, some sort of urgent issue, you know, an infection that's extending, um, then, you know, you, you do have that gift of time for a lot of these things. And, and a lot of them, as you know, just get better on their own anyway. So, you know, for instance, you know, middle ear effusions, uh, we know that if we wait one month, two months, three months, there's no long-term damage to the child as long as it eventually gets cleared up. And sometimes it gets cleared up on its own. So that's fine. And was it, was it the omega-3? Maybe. Was yeah. it just that it's now May or June and the sun <laughs> is shining? Could be that too. So, um, Oftentimes it's time and it's really hard. You know, a lot of times patients come to your office and they want something from you. They want like a little gift, a little parting gift, um, you know, like a ticket, like an antibiotic or, yeah. you know, a prescription for something. And it's really hard and sometimes frustrating when you tell patients, I'm giving you nothing. I'm giving you time. And time will usually take care of so many things that we see. And, you know, as you've probably probably heard, well, they did nothing. The doctor told me nothing. Well, <laughs> right. we saved you a surgery. We saved you an unnecessary antibiotic. Right. So, um, you know, sometimes actually that's the best thing we can give. Yeah. Um, with, so just going into COVID-19, um, you know, there's obviously so much that's happened in the last year um, in terms of masks, vaccines. There's also a lot of hype in the news and in social media. Um, what strategies from your book have you had do you apply in your day to day specific to this? Um, and what in, what is new or different about COVID-19, specifically the masks and vaccines that you've noticed? So I think, you know, something, some of the tools in the book that I think have helped uh, that during this pandemic is that uh, because everything is headline news in COVID-19, um, when you hear something in the headlines, you know, you say there's been so much this year, there's been so much this week. Um, every week it's, you know, a friend of mine who's an infectious disease specialist says, wait a COVID minute, and there's going to be some, you know, new radical information. And as we've seen time and time again, this past year or so that every headline that we hear just gets shifted a little bit over the following week or two, once we sort of really understand what it means. So, you know, that's something that I like to talk about in the book is that when you hear something that's so extreme, so good or so bad, it's neither is true. It's probably somewhere in the middle. So to step back and get a little information and don't make any major decisions based on one headline or even one scientific article, because it is going to change. Um, I think one of the lessons that we as physicians have learned during this pandemic is that we need to be flexible and we need to sort of move forward uh, with the data as it comes out. And so we've been sort of living in this data in real time in our lives. I mean, looking back just about a year ago, we, we were still saying as physicians, do not wear masks. If you are not a physician, up until about mid-April of 2020, we were telling people, don't wear a mask in public. It's not going to help you. It's not going to help the society around you. So don't wear a mask. I mean, it's amazing to think that we were saying that now, but now we're saying the complete opposite. Even after we're vaccinated, we're saying we still need to wear masks. So um, I think that we need to just be flexible. And it's a good lesson to us that, you know, when we're so dogmatic about something, you know, it, it you know, we, we switch as well. Yeah, I was watching a documentary that was field, filmed around that time and there a person and it was saying, yeah, we've got to shut down. We'll probably be back up and running in, you know, four to six weeks, you know, and we're kind of like giggling yeah. like, oh, yeah, you, th you think yeah. it's going to be four yeah. to six weeks. 
<laughs> try a year or more um, yeah. things things are um you know taking a little longer to get back to normal than we than any of us anticipated i think or at least for me um one of the things i loved in your book was the you you had a lot of the you know practical information you know things that we know are good for your health you know eating well, you know, fruits and vegetables and um, getting enough sleep. I, I love the part about, you know, how we used to like wear our lack of sleep as a badge of honor when we were in residency. <laughs> but, you know, now we know you need sleep, um, you know, um, wearing helmets when you're riding a bike, you know, not texting and driving all these things. Um, but these things just aren't sexy. They don't make headlines. You know, everybody wants to come and they want, you know, the, the magic pill or the, you know, they want a, a biohack. Um, so, so I think <laughs> it's just, it's good to have, you know, to kind of bring us back to the basics, things that are just tried and true that we've known forever that are good for your health and that, you know, that work. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty simple. It there's really and again, I, I agree what you say. People want sort of that new, you know, hot buzz of, you know, what's the best exercise, what's the best diet, uh, how many, you know, gallons of water should I be drinking every day or what kind of water should, you know, it should be alkaline. <laughs> um and and it's all there's so much unnecessary. There's so many simple things. Um, you know, and I, I talk about in the book about um the uh the Quaker population and, uh, and how, you know, they're so healthy because they just do very simple things. And, you know, part of their day to day is just their, their outdoors and exercising and doing a lot of activity. They eat a balanced diet. It's not the healthiest, uh, but they're not eating a lot of processed food and they're cooking their food and they're growing their food. And, you know, certainly we're not all farmers, but uh, there's really not that much we need to do. Uh, I think people are really looking for extremes and uh, it's it's really not necessary. Well, Dr. Shapiro, do you have any other advice for physicians when it comes to thinking critically about the literature or making other evidence-based recommendations at, from the physician standpoint? I think that, you know, this year has been, you know, we have learned our lesson this year uh, during the pandemic. Um, and that is that when we have a great article that we've read and it has great data and large groups of population, you know, large population, prospective, all the buzzwords we're supposed to hear, it's still not the final word. Um, we keep learning that. We we're learning that with vaccines right now. We're learning that with, you know, safe practices for COVID. And I think that really does apply to medicine and surgery as a whole in our practices. And so when, when we, uh, you know, when we trained 25 years ago, for instance, this is something simple, but, you know, it was strongly recommended that children should get antibiotics at the time and after tonsillectomy. There was one study that showed that it actually improved wound healing, reduced the bacterial count in the oropharynx, reduced postoperative bleeding, antibiotics 100%. And now there are large, you know, clinical data showing the complete opposite. And, you know, for many of us, myself included, it was really hard to make that switch. I remember the day that I became an antibiotic steward. I felt like I needed a badge because <laughs> I was not going to give an antibiotic to a child. And I was so worried about that patient, that one, that first patient, even though the data shows that this is unnecessary and potentially more harmful than helpful. Uh, so I think we just need to open our minds a little bit. We get locked into what we read we get locked into what we study. And, you know, I can, again, this year we lived in real time how quickly information can change based on just more studies that we're doing. The curse of the original belief happens to us as well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Well, um, just wrapping things up, any, any final thoughts that you would like to leave um, with our listeners other than, you know, go, go check out hype. If you have not <laughs> it's a already great read it, it is awesome. 
Thank you. Yes. No. Yeah. Hi, please take take a look. It's in. It's actually just came out in paperback this week, um, and it's also an audio book for those of you who like audio books and a Kindle. Um, but you know, I think as physicians, we really need to open our minds a little bit and really listen to patients. And um, you know, again, we are so accustomed to communicating with each other at a certain level and a certain language and quiet understanding that we have with one another, that we, you know, it's like us and them, they are the patients, we are the doctors, that, um, you know, it needs to be more of a sort of group communication and listening to your patients really does open our eyes. And oftentimes they have a lot of good information that, that we might not have known about. That's awesome. I think that's yeah. a, a great place to, um, to land it. Yeah. What thank you, you so much. Yeah, no, I learned a ton. Thank you so much, Dr. Shapiro. It was a great opportunity. I enjoyed your book. Um, thank you for coming on the show. I love, I, I like to just open our minds and listen. I think that's something that is good. It's a good life pearl, actually. <laughs> I need to do that with my kids more. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, <laughs> or they need to do it more with me. Exactly, it's a two-way teenagers. Yeah, um, Dr. Shapiro, are you, you. Um, are you on social media at all? If um, people want to look you up or follow you, follow you just a little. Yes, um, <laughs> it's uh, at Dr. Nina Shapiro at like at Dr. Nina Shapiro uh, Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you. You guys are on. Uh, I think I follow you on something. Uh, we, yes. Thank you for the plug. We we yes. are at at underscore backtable ENT. Yes, I am. Yeah. We're on Twitter and Instagram as well. Yeah. Likewise. Yeah. Yep. And Good. we just opened that released our, so we, they find our podcast on Apple, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and now Ghana, which is a bigger audio streaming that's, that's I think great. primarily used in India. So hopefully uh, we can uh, include more international speakers and topics that's as well. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Far and yeah. wide. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you guys. This is so much fun. Well, yeah, thank you for being it. here. And thank you, Kieran, for whatever you magic you did. <laughs> <Yes>. Thank <laughs> you to our sound engineer, Kieran I Gannon. The, I hope the clo the clocks weren't too bad. No, I mean, they're, are great. they're there, but it's, it's just one. <laughs> but it's great. We can hear you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> big, big thank you to our listeners. Thank you to, to Ann Dang for, for social media and Varun Sagi and Wasik Nadim for blog posts. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for our listeners for tuning in, returning listeners, as well as any new listeners. Uh, we love your feedback. So let us know topics or feedback or if you want to come on the show. That's a wrap. That's a wrap. <laughs>